heard this beat in my dream. to all of you who are joining our online service today and um, we have another service every Sunday on zoom so I just want to encourage you if you can make it to that then it's a great experience it's a great time of face-to-face -face interaction you know just to see people I know it's on zoom but it's great to see our brothers and sisters it's great to worship you know we have live worship led by um, the worship team at Teguin and it's just a, a lovely time we get to pray together and listen to the word of God together so if you can make it to those I want to encourage you to join us there the Zoom codes are available for you if you just get in touch with us on our social media platforms, if you're connected to the WhatsApp information group, or you can email us at welcome at tgwin.org. Um, just as a notice for next week, next Thursday at half past seven, we have our church prayer meeting going beyond the veil where we just sit and we listen to what God's got to say to us. And we just give him thanks and praise that we can be with him. And today, just as I'm handing over, we're going to be listening to Pastor Don Bird. He's pastor at Sunny Hill Church down in Paul. It's a great, vibrant church, and he's bringing us a powerful message today. And it's all about how we are transformed to look outward. You know, we've been going through this series from the inside out, and it's all about how God transforms us. He changes us on the inside so that we can be more outward looking to save those who are lost. So let's, let's just pray to begin with. Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you because you are an awesome God. You are an amazing, powerful God, Lord, and we get to be with you today. And we pray for the message that Pastor Dom has, has prepared to share with us this morning. Lord, we thank you for the words you've given him, and we just pray that all of us have teachable spirits so that we can hear what you are saying to us today. Give us ears to hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. We just ask Holy Spirit that you just come in power into every home that you'll just minister to us in the name of Jesus. Amen. God bless, guys. Good morning, Teguin Community Church. It is such a privilege to be sharing God's word with you today. Man, I love your leaders, Pastor Ivan and Rian. Just amazing couple, the real deal. And um, I have the privilege of leading Sunny Hill Church alongside my wife, Louise. Uh, we've been married for 14 years, I think. She's not here, so it doesn't really matter whether I get that right or wrong. And we've got three boys, Caleb, who's nine, Judah, who's seven, Zeke, who's 
Four, I think. Four, definitely four. And um, yeah, we would love to be with you in person today at Teguin Community Church. Of course, I think that's how you say it, Teguin Community Church. I've been working on my Welsh all week just to get that right. Oh, it's beautiful, isn't it? Oh, it's beautiful. For those of you who have already logged out of Zoom because you're so offended, I'm going to miss you. It was nice knowing you for the last 40 seconds. Um, but hey, we love whales. We, we love dolphins. We love all sorts of marine life. It's brilliant. Oh, dad joke. Boom. Love it. Anyways, thank you so much for the invitation to come and share God's word with you today. You know, what you're kind of looking at at the moment as a church is this theme of from the inside out. And I've been asked specifically to look at the idea of being transformed to look outward. And so throughout this message today, hopefully, I want to help you understand the purpose of your transformation. So the reason I love the name of your series, From the Inside Out, is because this is how we're called to live, isn't it? I mean, when you think of it, what flows from us is the product of what's in us. Let me say that again. What flows from us is the product of what's in us. It's what I call the law of the seed. And it finds its origin right back in the Old Testament as an irreversible law that God establishes in Genesis 8.22. Check this out. This is what it says in Genesis 8.22. It says, while the earth remains, seed time and harvest... Okay, so as long as the earth remains, this is going to be a principle, an irreversible principle of harvest. There's going to be a seed time and then there's going to be a crop. There's going to be a seed planted and then there's going to be a fruit produced. And it says, so while the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night shall not cease. Now, of course, this passage is speaking to the natural dynamics of the seasons and the harvesting cycles that we see working out in agricultural terms. But what is true in the natural is also true in the supernatural, in the spiritual. And what I want to ask you this morning, just as a premise to this message, is this, is what are you producing in your life? Or, or maybe more aptly, what are you producing with your life? Jesus puts it this way in Mark 7 when he's grilled uh, by the religious leaders on this kind of moment that happens where Jesus and his disciples are eating but they don't seem to be following the established kind of instructions of elders to make sure that they're washing their hands before meals. Now you know as parents that's something that we do at the dinner table. Whenever we serve dinner we say kids make sure you've washed your hands But the elders in the context of Mark 7 had established a rule because their kind of understanding was that they would get dirt on the inside of them and therefore kind of by not having clean hands when you come to eat, you're going to make yourself unclean. And so Jesus challenges this notion. He says this in Mark 7 verse 15. He says, there is nothing outside a person that by going into him can defile him, but the things that come out of a person are what defile him. In other words, Jesus is radically um, addressing the, the human constructs of his day. He's saying, listen, it's not what goes into you that makes you unclean. It's actually what comes out of you that makes you unclean. He goes on. I think it's in verse 18 or 17. It says this, what goes into the mouth doesn't affect your heart, but rather it affects your stomach. However, what comes out of a person speaks to what's going on in the heart. And, and here's the principle is that the fruit that you produce is indicative of what's going on on the inside because what flows from you is a product of what's going on inside of you. So I I kind of want to give you a tip today and I think this could be really helpful for you, okay? And it's kind of a helpful soundbite for us to remember and it's this, is that if you don't like the fruit that's growing change the seed that you're sowing. I'll say that again. If you don't like the fruit that's growing, change the seed that you're sowing. I believe that this is where most people go wrong in life. And I say that with (laughs) as much humility as I can muster as a parent. I think I've gone wrong here as a parent many times. I think I've gone wrong as a husband many times. Even as a church leader, I think this is an area where I've gone wrong. What do I mean by this? Is that I think so often we get fixated on trying to address the fruit that's being produced. What do I mean by that? We try to address 
the behavior that we don't like. We try to address, um, you know, the outworking of something that we don't like. For example, in our kids, if we see an attribute that we're not really fond of, okay, like maybe I've got three boys, Caleb who's nine, Judah who's seven, Zeke who's four, if they're fighting all the time, as a parent, my immediate instinct is to address the behavior. And, and that's, that's a cool approach to parenting. Like, you should address behavior. There should be consequences to wrong behaviors and wrong attitudes. However, if I want to transform my children's lives, then I don't just want to deal with the fruit of their behavior. I need to deal with the seed of the behavior. I think this could be really helpful for you going through life. Like in your marriage, I think so often we only ever try to, to address the fruit that has been produced rather than getting really forensic with the seed that has been sown. Just think about that for a moment as a parent. If there's something that your children are doing repeatedly and it's not something that you're kind of a fan of, is actually rather than thinking, right, well, how, how do I address, like, you know, what do I do? Like, stop doing this, stop doing that. But rather instead, what is the cause of that fruit being born in their lives. You know, so one of the things that we pinpoint often bad attitude and bad behavior uh, alongside is too, watching too much YouTube, okay? And so if that's the seed, in other words, if that's the seed that is then embedding something that goes on to produce something unhelpful, then I need to deal with the seed rather than just deal with the fruit. I think like this is so important as we think about this idea of living from the inside out because you know it's like looking at almost a, an orange that is fruit obviously and thinking well I really want an apple so if I paint this orange red and I put a little stalk in the top and I inject some pips into the middle of it then somehow maybe it's going to be an apple but it doesn't matter how you dress it it's still an orange because what determines the fruit is the seed that goes into the ground Jesus obviously says it better than me in Luke chapter 6, verse 43 to 45, he says, No good tree bears bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. Like, it's just impossible. Why? Genesis 8, 22, seed time and harvest, an irreversible law. He says in verse 44, Luke chapter 6, Each tree is recognized by its own fruit. People do not pick figs from thorn bushes or grapes from briars. A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart, and an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. Think about that. The mouth speaks what the heart is full of. Why? Because what flows from you is the product of what's in you. The mouth speaks what the heart is full of. So today I've been asked to speak into the theme of being transformed to look outward. Now, how does this relate to what I've been speaking about? Well, Jesus says with regards to fruit and teachers and even disciples and prophets, he says these really kind of profound words. He says, how will you know who belongs to me? He suggests by their fruit. In other words, this is how you identify if somebody is a Jesus follower, by the fruit that they are producing in their lives. And I think we often get this bit wrong because we think that God transforms us to save us. But that's, that's not true at all because transformation doesn't precede salvation. Transformation follows salvation. What does transformation mean? It means to be changed from one form to another, to be transformed, transformed, to be changed in form. Jesus doesn't change us to save us, he saves us to change us. And it's a subtle difference, but it's one that's really important, particularly in this day that we live. You know, you think about this, is that like he saves you regardless of your fruit. Like you could be the world's biggest loser, you could be the world's biggest heathen. You could be the world's biggest pagan, but like ultimately, he doesn't save you because of the fruit you're producing in your life. He saves you so that you can produce fruit in your life. Oh, you can think of it like this. You didn't repent to get God's grace. You just didn't repent to get God, God's grace. You repented because you got God's grace. Paul says in Romans, he says it's his, it's his kindness that leads us to repentance. That actually grace and mercy and kindness precede the process of transformation, precede the process 
of repentance. Repentance doesn't precede the moment of salvation. There's this responsibility on us as believers of Jesus, and I think the world needs us more than ever to walk in the transformation that is now possible as a result of of knowing Jesus as our Savior. And this is hugely important because your transformation, it's, it's less about how you feel. It doesn't matter how you feel because transformation doesn't speak to that stuff. It's more about who you are and by extension what you do. That, that's why James says uh, in the book of James, it's a very controversial statement that all, almost meant that James was left out of the canonization of Scripture. But thank goodness it wasn't. So where James says, faith without works is dead. What is he saying? That you have to work to be saved? No, the opposite. You work because you're saved. What, flow, what flows from us is the product of what's in us. If we are saved, there will be fruitfulness in our lives. So we don't produce fruit to be saved. We produce fruit because we are saved. And this is a necessary kind of thing to wrap your head around as we think about what it means to be transformed to look outward. Because the purpose of our transformation isn't just to make you feel good. The purpose of your transformation is for you to reach the world in which you live. It's to reach your colleagues in the workplace, to reach family members and friends and neighbours, stuff like that. It's, it's so important that like transformation, the purpose of transformation in my life isn't to kind of get me saved. It's because I am saved. Now this transformation is to be served as a fruit for other people to see and witness. It's my testimony. So transformation isn't about your feeling, it's about your fruit. Jesus says this, doesn't he, in John 13, 35. He says, by this, everyone know, everyone will know that you are my disciples. What is it? If you love one another. Like one of the most profound witnessing tools we have is just by allowing the world to see the fruit flowing from our lives. You know, my prayer more than ever in this season of COVID and lockdown is not that the church gets more slicker online engagement. It's that individual disciples would begin to produce fruit like they've never produced before. That becomes so attractive and appealing to the world around them that people start to think, well, what is going on? What is different about that person? You see, transformation isn't to save a person's soul. Transformation is the product of a soul that is saved. Still don't believe me? Look at what Paul says in Ephesians 5, verse 8. He gives this instruction. He says, walk as children of light. And then it says in brackets in verse 9, for the fruit of light is found in all that is good, right, and true. In other words, if you feed on the seed of what is right, good, and true, there's going to be a fruit that is like this piercing light. And in verse 10, and try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret, but when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore it says, and I love this little soundbite, Awake, O sleeper, and rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. This idea that this waking up is this salvation moment. As I wake up and as I rise from the dead into my new life in Christ, it's at that point that Christ's light shines on me. It's at that moment that the fruit of light is shone. Paul continues in verse 15. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time. I love how the NIV records it. It says, make the most of every opportunity. Why? Because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Don't get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. In other words, again, deal with the seed. If you don't want the fruit of chaos, don't feed on the seed of drunkenness. You know, if you don't want the fruit of chaos, don't feed on the seed of adultery, idolatry, deception. But instead, feed on the seed of generosity. Feed on the seed of the Spirit. He says this, he says, Be filled with the Spirit, verse 19, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with all your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. 
You see, I'm not against Alpha courses. I'm really not. I'm not against Christianity Explored. Like those courses and outreach programs are brilliant. But I think the reason that they are necessary is because the church isn't producing the fruit that we should be totally producing. Because I believe if believers really feed on the seed of the Spirit and the seed of the Word, then ultimately our witness is changed lives, transformed lives, transformed in order to reach out. You know, this thing really challenged me and it almost haunts me. It's this moment um, in the Gospels and in Matthew 4.19 specifically where Jesus is inviting the first disciples to come and follow him. This is how he phrases it. He says, come, follow me, okay, and I will make you fishers of men. Or another translation, come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people, okay. But I love the NIV translation, come, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. It's because for me, I see two components to that invitation. The first one is this, come, follow me. What does that speak to? I believe that speaks to salvation. It is your following of Jesus that is saving you. It's your relationship with Jesus that is saving you. It, 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 it's that reality that as I follow Jesus through, through the good times and through the hard times, that is the thing where I am being saved. Like it's an ongoing process. I am being saved as I follow Jesus. But then he says, and I will make you fishers of men. So, so we are saved okay, and we know Jesus, but our transformation is for the benefit of the world. Come follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. This changes everything, because ultimately Jesus came. Jesus came to seek and save that which was lost, and when you are found, you become part of that mission mandate. Now all of a sudden I have been transferred from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light, to the kingdom of the Son that God loves. And now my life is poured out as an offering. Why? Because now I understand that I'm all good with God, that I have been made right with God, a work of grace, a work that only God can do in my life. But now I'm transformed. Why? So that I can reach others. Understanding this is a game changer because as you begin to see how your witness is so, um, so closely tied to the fruitfulness that you are producing. It's a huge issue because now as we produce fruit, we are almost sowing seeds in the lives of others. You know, we've all heard of Billy Graham. I mean, what a tremendous man of faith he was. I mean, millions saved and impacted under his ministry. But you probably haven't heard of Edward Kimball. Most people haven't heard of Edward Kimball. Now, let me tell you a little bit about Edward Kimball. Edward Kimball, right, he was a Sunday school teacher. Okay, so this is back, I think, in like the early 1800s. Like this was a way that the, the church would serve society by educating children. Uh, so he was a Sunday school teacher. He was a man of God. He was born of the Spirit. And he had a conviction to really reach some of the roughest lads off the estate that was coming to Sunday school. And he had such a conviction that he would work tirelessly to kind of just share the gospel with them, to produce fruit, to demonstrate to them what, it, what a life kind of under uh, in surrender to Jesus truly looks like and he was fixated by one boy who just seemed to be rowdy and a bit of a troublemaker um, to such an extent that he just thought like he just continued to pray and then he thought well you know what I need to get into his life more because he needs to know Jesus he, ne he needs to know Jesus and, and so he would go to the place where this young man would work uh, which was a shoe store where, where this, this lad in his teenage years would stack shelves, okay? And Kimball would confront this young man like regularly saying, listen, you need Jesus, you need Jesus. And like there's this moment that you read about in his book where uh, he kind of confronts this young guy in a store cupboard where they're storing shoes. A and this young guy just kind of just gives up the chase and he's like, okay, I I'll give my life to Jesus, okay? And in that place, this young man decides to follow Jesus with his whole life. He decides to respond to the invitation to come follow Jesus. Okay, now what's really amazing is that young man is known by the name D.L. Moody. 
And I'm sure we've all heard of D.L. Moody. That's where D.L. Moody was saved in that shoe cupboard, okay, in the shoe shop where he worked. Now, many of us, some of us will know that Moody like lit up two continents for Jesus. Absolutely crazy, seeing hundreds of thousands saved, of which one of them, one of the people that got saved under Moody's ministry was a person by the name Wilbur Chapman. Now, Wilbur Chapman was invited to go to one of Moody's crusades by his grandmother. Okay, the fruit in Wilbur Chapman's kind of grandmother's life was to invite her grandson to go to one of Moody's crusades. Now, Chapman gave his life to Christ and became an evangelist that spoke to thousands. Okay, absolutely amazing. Now, I need you to track with me because this is really interesting. Now, and one day when Chapman was doing one of his evangelistic kind of uh, ministry outreaches, a professional baseball player kind of came to one of his rallies and gave his life to Jesus. His name was Billy Sunday. That day was the day when Billy Sunday decided to respond to the invitation to follow Jesus. And as a result, Billy Sunday left baseball and joined Chapman's team of evangelists and would go around continents just sharing the gospel. But eventually Chapman decided that he was going to start a church. And so Billy Sunday decided to start his own outreach ministry. And for years he would preach the gospel. But one day when he was preaching, a young boy by the name Mordecai Ham came up and was invited to one of uh, Billy Sunday's campaigns by his school teacher. Mordecai Ham surrendered his life to Jesus and then eventually uh, went on to start doing his own evangelistic crusades too. By which one day a teenager rocked up at one of uh, Mordecai Ham's rallies and responding to an invitation from his best mate gave his life to Jesus and that young man was Billy Graham who goes on to like just serve God and see millions come to Jesus. The Christian is to witness for Christ now, how do you witness? You witness by the way you live. The smile, the courtesy, the thoughtfulness, the graciousness. You're witnessing for Christ. And if you live a changed life in which Christ is living in you and radiating out through you, other people will be attracted to you and they'll say, what's your secret? And you'll say, I know Jesus Christ. This is, this is a huge kind of thing for us to consider. We've all heard of Billy Graham. Most of us have never heard of Edward Kimball. Yet from the, the fruit of Edward Kimball's life, this seed grew and it grew through the life of D.L. Moody, Wilbur Chapman, Billy Sunday, Mordecai Ham, and ultimately Billy Graham. And, and here's something I just want you to think about, and I think this is a really cool statement for us to ponder, is that you can count the apples on a tree, can't you? you can, literally count the apples of the tree 40 41 I almost lost my count there 42 43 44 you can count the apples on a tree but you can't count the apples in a seed okay so you can count the apples on a tree but you can't count the potential of all the apples in the seed and my friend that's what you are it's we're talking about the seed what is the seed that we're sowing you know today I was asked to speak on this idea of being transformed to look outward but I think a kind of more helpful I guess succinct way of understanding the content of this message is this is that changed people change people changed people change people see Jesus wants to change you today he wants to transfer you from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of God he wants to save you. He wants to touch those areas in your life that are truly dysfunctional and broken, which is pretty much all of them. You know, and, and he wants to reform you. But then what he wants to do is he just doesn't want to save your soul. He wants to transform you. And as you are transformed, he wants to make you effective at now becoming Christ to the world around you. This is how the commission works. Jesus calls his disciples, reaches his disciples, saves his disciples. But in the process of following, he makes them fishers of men, fishers of people. Friends, this is why. This is why we want to be transformed. 
We want to be transformed because we know that people's lives in the world depend on us producing fruit that is in keeping with repentance, producing fruit that is screaming that there is a saviour, producing fruit that in a time of turmoil and in a time of fear and in a time of anguish and anxiety, there is something so different about Christians. There is something so different about people who profess to be followers of Jesus Christ. And it's more than them just going to church on a Sunday. Jesus didn't die on a cross so that you could go to church on a Sunday. He died on the cross so that you could know total resurrection and know a total transformation from the inside out. That is the life that Jesus has called us to, friends. And I really want to pray with you today to that end because First of all, if you don't know Jesus as your saviour, there's an opportunity for you to make that right today and say, Jesus, I call upon your name. Jesus, I want to know you. Jesus, I want to follow you. But then there's also an opportunity today that if you already know Jesus to say, Jesus, would you help me to become more like you? Would you continue to transform my life? Would you show me the seed in my life that isn't producing the fruit that you want me to produce and give me the strength to address it? So let's pray together. Father God, right now I pray for my friends, Lord, in Wales, checking out this, this message and listening to this broadcast. For those who don't know you today, Lord, I just pray for them. I pray, God, that they will get a revelation of who you are. And if you don't know Jesus and you want to know Jesus, then pray this prayer after me. Jesus, I ask you to come into my heart. Jesus, I ask you to forgive me of my wrongdoing. Jesus, I ask you to forgive me for all the mistakes I have made. And Jesus, I ask that I would know you, that I would seek you. Help me to know that I am loved by you. In Jesus' name, amen. And for all my other friends today who already know Jesus as their saviour, I just want to pray over you that in these days, in these difficult, challenging days, where kind of it's, it's, it's harder than ever to be the church, I want to pray that you would see fruit born in your life that affects the world in which you live. So Father, I pray for my brothers and sisters on this broadcast today, Lord. May they just know your hand of transformation working in their life. Father, would you just uproot any seed that is at odds with the ethos of your kingdom and would you help to embed seed that will go on to produce fruit that would lead to the salvation of many father i thank you lord that you didn't just save us so that we could go to church on sunday you saved us that we could be free and be transformed so that we could reach out to the world around us jesus have your way in our life in jesus name amen Tigran Community Church, thank you so much for allowing me the privilege of sharing God's word with you today. May you know the blessing of God as you go into this week. And I can't wait to see you soon in person. I hope. Bless you guys. Have a great Sunday.